do uh, online anyway. But again, thank you so very much for taking your time uh, to listen to me today. So this paper is called Organizing Data Analytics. It's a joint paper with Ricardo Alonso from uh, LSE. And this is a slide I got from the Wall Street Journal this morning. So it's still September 7th for me. Uh, so this morning, Wall Street Journal was talking about the uh, trial of Elizabeth Holmes, who was the former CEO of Theranos. So if you're not familiar with the case, Theranos was a pharmaceutical company st startup, uh, and they were accused of saying that the product was really great and was doing all those uh, lab tests with one drop of blood. And it turns out that uh, it was all a lie that they were saying that they were testing the product and the product was working perfectly and it was not. It was just false information. Uh, and they got a bunch of investors to put money in the company and the company was worth nothing because they didn't have the product at the end of the day. So the trial is going on right now. It is on the media, this tampering with information. Another uh, example that we got from COVID because it's everything about COVID now is data from Iran. So the yellow line is what uh, the government in Iran was telling the number of uh, COVID death war in the country. The red uh, line is the uncovered data that BBC got from other sources uh, saying that the number is much higher. So again, either, either when we're talking about organizations as firms uh, looking for profit, or when you're thinking about organization as government, we do see in many different scenarios, incentives for actors to lie about information, lie about what the information that they are gathering to attain some objective. And it's not only about lying about information, it is also about not getting information in the first place. So John Hopkins University is gathering information from all the US, uh, US states and other countries about COVID. And there are different ways to compute what's the positivity rate, what's, you know, what's the percentage of uh, COVID tests, they are positive, uh, there are different approaches. One of the approaches is you compute the number of cases over the number of people who tested for COVID. And it turns out that out of the 50 states in the US, more than half, 30 states, do not supply data that allows John Hopkins to compute this. So they simply do not collect and uh, give those data. There are a few different approaches. I think approach number three, uh, over 40 states do not give that data, okay? So the states simply say, I I'm not collecting and I'm not uh, giving out the, uh, the data for the decision makers who are other politicians or even uh, us that are deciding whether or not I should come to USC. I would like to have that data. I just don't have that data because that's not provided by them. So at the end of the day, you know, those broad examples are just to come to two points, which are the points that we want to talk about today. First, that information, so when we're talking about information and that information is endogenous to the organizations generating the, uh, that information. So my two points are the design of experimentation, that the organization or the agent in, within that organization chooses what data to gather and uh, what we can learn from that data. Also, it chooses uh, how to report, what data to report once you get that data. Am I going to lie about the data and I'm going to tamper with the results of my, uh, of my experience, my survey, or the data that I'm collecting or not? So again, those two points that we see in those examples, which is, you choose what to experiment. You choose what information to gather. I don't gather this particular information about COVID. And you choose whether or not to lie about the information that you're collecting, okay? And this happens in many different organizations, uh, private sector, public sector, with inside our universities. We know those things happen. In this paper, we want to study that. We're gonna study organization as a uh, place where we have a delegated experimentation. So the principle that's gonna make the decision maker that's gonna decide something is not able 
to gather the information. So it's going to delegate this experimentation to someone else. And we're going to look at this designer sender receiver game. So someone is going to design the information that's going to be collected. Someone is going to analyze and report on that information. That's the sender here. And then our receiver is going to take an action, is going to make a decision based on this information that was provided. And our main question is, how do firms evaluate organization structures, different organization structures and policy in face of those two things that we were talking about, the endogenous experimentation and the possibility of temp, okay, within the organization. So, you know, how to design organization is a really big question. So we're gonna focus on four levers, four things that the organization can design uh, in this game. So task allocation, which is, do I want a person that designs the signal to be the same one that analyzes the data and uh, reports the result, okay? Or do I want to separate those two agents? Uh, how much do I want to audit, okay? Can I go back and look at your data and try to figure out whether you're tampering with this data or not? Now, what's the intensity that I want to audit this process, this analysis? Um, if I can, if I can change how easy it is for you to tamper with data, what do I want to do? Do I want to make it easier? Do I want to make it harder? What are the trade-offs when I change your ability to tamper with the data? And finally, what can I do if the decision maker has discretion, in particular, if the decision maker can commit to not take certain actions, how can I improve my organization using this extra lever? So we're gonna talk about those four levers. I'm gonna mostly focus on levers one and two in the organization. And then at the end, if I have time, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about three and four. And you know, if you, if you don't listen to anything else uh, that I have to say today, uh, one message that I want you to remember is that is that we're going to uncover this and going to be very specific about this, that fostering experimentation, that pulling my levers to get you to experiment more, more to get a Blackwell more formative experiment is going to be many times at odds with reducing tampering. That when I try to make you experiment more, I'm also uh, uh, getting you to temper more in equilibrium. And that's a problem. So I have these conflicting goals of trying to uh, get those two things at the same time, less tempering and more information. That's really hard. That's usually I'm going to have a trade-off between those two. All right. So uh, that is a related literature. We have like a nice section in the paper. Given the time constraint, I'm going to skip it. Uh, but let me just emphasize there's a lot of nice papers right now dealing with uh, information design and what happens when we relax the commitment assumptions of the sender. So that's partially what we are doing here. We're talking about the sender that might lie, so he cannot commit to always tell the truth about the signal that, uh, uh, that uh, he receives. But we're doing much more than that because we're thinking about that within a organization and how can I design the structure of my organization to get more information to the decision maker at the end of the day. And we are really focusing on auditing and what can I do, what can the decision maker do with auditing? Okay, so let me dive straight to the model. So that is a binary state, zero and one, zero, one, and we have a common prior meal, which is the probability that that state is one. So for most of the talk, I'm gonna focus on case one, which we call organized to innovate. In this case, the principal, who is the receiver, has to choose whether to uh, keep the status quo, I'm gonna call that decision DS, or scale up, I'm gonna call that decision D high. Okay, so that's, so it's a binary state, as of right now is a binary action, the decision maker, the principal, that's gonna be the receiver using the information, can scale up D high or keep the status quo DS. 
So the principal's utility, if he scales up, is simply theta. So he wants to scale up when the state is high, not when the state is low. Uh, and if he just keeps the status quo, that's a safe option that just pays him Q bar, okay, this Q bar. So here's the principal's ind indirect utility function. If his posterior belief Q is really high, if he's confident that if she's confident that the state is one, she's going to scale up. If she's confident that the state is low, she's just going to keep the status quo. So very simple utility of the principal. What about the agent? Super simple also. The agent wants more, okay? So the agent wants the project to get more funding. The agent wants, wants the new product to be approved. The agent wants more resources for the division. So it's just an agent that wants to scale up. So the agent receives VH if he scales up, if the decision maker uh, uh, scales up, and the agent uh, receives VS if the status quo is the same. So the agent wants to move up. The principal only wants to move up if the state is uh, high, if the state is one. Okay. Now let's talk about those agents within the firm. And that's a novelty here with the paper respect to uh, this literature. So we have a designer, a agent that's called a designer that's gonna select an experiment just like in the Bayesian persuader, persuasion paper of Kamenitska and Jensko, okay? So you choose a signal, uh, and here just to simplify, this signal is gonna say what are the posterior beliefs and what are the probabilities of those posterior beliefs. All different experiments have the same cost. Uh, so it's just, you know, uh, Kamenitska and Jensko choose a signal, okay? Now the analyst, is the one that's gonna privately observe the result of the experiment and is gonna observe a cost for tampering. How much does it cost for the analyst to switch the result of the experiment? Okay, so the analyst is gonna observe, okay, the result was Q. I can tell Q, I can report Q was the result, or I can pay a cost C and switch the result to something else to try to tamper and try to fool the receiver. So we're thinking about tampering as a opportunity to mispresent the, the message, okay? So how easy it is for me to cook the books. You no, know, I'm gonna put effort to think about a, a way to cook the books, to change the results, or I might need to bribe someone and I do not know how easy it is to bribe someone to be able to change the data. Uh, it might be uh, about the punishment that I might get if I get, if I tamper or not. And the crucial thing here, very important in this paper, is I do not know exactly what's going to be the cost of tampering. Okay. Once, you know, at the beginning of the game, when we are designing the experiment, we know that there is a cost of tampering. This cost of tampering follows some distribution F. Okay, so there is a distribution of cost of tampering, but we only observe the actual cost of tampering of changing the result once I get the result and I figure out how hard it's going to be to change it. Okay. Uh, can I uh, ask a quick question? Um, yes, please go ahead. Um, so, um, is it important that you're assuming that uh, this cost uh, doesn't depend on how much you lie? So, you may think that small lies uh, uh, are less costly. Yes, it is. It is. It is important. Okay. So if it is, if it is somehow, if it has some re relationship with the size of the lies and everything, we do not know to, how to solve the general case. What I can tell you, what I can tell you that works is the following: If I think about cost as a punishment that's proportional to the profit that I make, okay. So let's say you know, think about a civil lawsuit that I'm lying and I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get a I'm going to get a punishment that's more than proportional to the profit. What you can think about C here is that there is my maximum liability for that. In, this, in the sense that small lies are not going to be profitable because I'm going to be punished much more than, you know, it's like damages in the US, you know. Yes, you, you, you profit $100, but they're going to punish you a million dollars for that. 
So you don't want to make small lies because they are not profitable. But because there is a maximum punishment that I can get, and if you think about that cap for C, that's the big lie that I'm going to go for. You know, if you think about limited liability. So that's that's something that works. It's kind of, you know, it is not the best case scenario. The best case scenario is if we could have a very general cost function that depends on pi. But right now, what we can do is this. What we can do is that is a cost distribution that is independent of that. I like to think about that as limited liability. And I'm figuring out what's my limited liability. Small lies are too costly because I'm going to be overproportionately punished for that. But then big lies, you know, that, you know, they, they, they cannot give me the death penalty for, for lying on, on my financial reports. So there are, there are limits on those. So think about C as, as those limits. All right. So again, a designer is the one that's going to choose the signal. Is choosing the signal knowing the probability distribution of costs, but doesn't know the cost realization. The analyst is going to observe the result is going to figure out how hard it is to change the result. And the analyst has to choose. I can tell the truth or I can tamper, pay the cost C and choose another result and lie about the result of the, of the experiment. The experiment's public. So there's no uncertainty about what's the experiment. It's like a survey. We all know the survey questions. The questions that were in the survey, we all know. We don't know if the analyst is switching those answers once he gets the results. That's the thing that we don't know. That's private for the, and that tampering is private for the analyst. Now, in our, let me start with two levers of the organization, what the organization can do. First one is the task allocation. So at the beginning of the game, the principal is going to choose what's the organization, whether it is integrated, is scripted I over here which means there is a single agent designing the experiment and reporting the results. So it's like one person, okay? Which means that that one person is going to bear the cost of any lies, okay? So if the person is designing the experiment, it's going to collect the data and is going to report. So if he lies, he's paying for the cost of lying. And the other... Uh, um, structure of the organization is separation of those tasks. So one agent is going to design the experiment. You know, it's going to get payoff V high if the action is high of the designer of the receiver. is going to get payoff uh, VS if the status quo remain, but he doesn't pay line costs because he's not the one reporting. Okay, The one reporting is a different agent, which is the analyst. And he's the one that's going to bear the cost of lie if he chooses to lie. Okay, so that's the first design of the organization. The principal is going to announce publicly and commit to this structure of the organization, whether those things are separate or are the same. And then the principal also is going to choose a auditing intensity, which I'm going to call lambda. So lambda is the probability that the principal is going to be able to observe the true result of the experiment. Okay, so think about before the experiment takes place, the principal uh, invests in cameras, in data security, in, in auditing technology, just sets up how easy it's going to be for the principal to detect any lie that goes on. Okay. So that's lambda, it's the probability that you're able to, to verify the experiment, to verify if the experiment is correct or not. With probability one minus lambda, you don't learn nothing else. You know, if you think about your audit is inconclusive, you just do not know if the guy lied or not, if he's telling the truth or not when he gives you an answer. So, Arlon, so can I ask you? Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, so the principal can take uh, both uh, decisions so at the, at the same time, meaning he designs both how the tasks are going to be allocated and, in addition, the auditing technology? Yes, and you can shoot those down. So in the paper, it's like, 
I'm going to talk about those four policies uh -huh. that the principal can do. You can shoot down three and say, you cannot control that. You know, this is right. exhaustions and you only think about that one. It's fine. I'm okay. just putting those two, two here because we're going to be talking about mostly about those two policies here today. But, you know, you can shut one down. So we can analyze, suppose that is separation, period. Uh -huh. You cannot do anything about it. What's the optimal lambda? Or suppose that lambda is fixed, is something. What's the optimal task location? We can do that. We, mm -hmm. we, we can do that. Um, over the cases where, let's say, the, the, the analyst or uh, the designer of information also choose uh, the, the task allocation, right? Because in some, you know, this obviously depends on exactly what you want to study, but in some cases, it may be uh, more natural to assume that the designer of the experiment chooses uh, the task allocation. He could, we could do that. Um, we didn't, we didn't do, I think, I think the answer is going to be very similar. I think, let, let me show the result and then, uh, and then my guess, my guess, if, if I think about it, is that the designer will always want to delegate to someone else. That, that, not the designer, sorry. The, yes, the designer would, would want to delegate to someone else. Now, the question is whether the principal we want to do that or not. So let, let me give you the result when the principal choose, and then I'm going to speculate on your question, which is actually a good question. We hadn't, we hadn't thought about that. Can, can I ask uh, another question? Uh, which yes. Is sort of similar to, to JC's. Um, so you, you, you put this kind of restrictions that uh, the principal can do this, or the principal can do that. Um, so a, a more natural thing, like theoretically, would be to sort of uh, treat it as a mechanism design problem, where there are some constraints. Can you sort of uh, um, uh, microfound these restrictions about uh, what the principal can or cannot do in the, in organization using uh, mechanism design thinking? Yeah. So one thing is like we we are like there's not going to be site transfers here also which is you know other thing that you you could think about so we are really thinking and once you see the result we are really thinking about okay i have this structure that i have control of that i possibly have control of which is whether or not to separate those things is it good or bad now if i start to add other things like maybe I can uh, place a bet on it, or you know, I, can, I can give you a site transfer, site payment for, for other things, becomes, a, becomes more problematic. Uh, even here, it's like the principal might want to pay directly to the agent for a more informative signal if I can have that transfer. So here's really when I cannot have that transfer, I cannot pay you more directly by uh, uh, by you giving a more informative signal, can I do something else by organize the structure of the firm? And this one in particular, you know, the ones that we, we, we chose here in particular are ones that we think are relevant, that, that is relevant for a firm to say whether a division is the one can, that can choose what information to get or if it is a central planner you know, a central division to university or on the um, firm that's that's uh, di dictating what you can do. Like, for example, can I, you know, talking about universities, uh, does your department choose who's going to be the letter writers or does a committee in the college, you know, in the upper division chooses who is going to be the letter writers or chooses which questions should be for a letter writers for a tenure uh, case? Okay, does, you know, does the, in the United States, does the CDC in the United States is the one that dictates for to the states what information they should be getting or is that delegated for them and then is analyzed by hospitals? So it's just seem, you know, this particular one seems as a natural starting point for us of just to understand what happens when we separate those tasks. Okay, without the more general, without the more general mechanism design and you know, and other policies that I could have here. So, uh, which which I do not know how much we can get extra. You know, how how close to the principles first best we can we can get. I do not. Know. I know here uh, uh, with those constraints. All right. 
Um, so, so here, very important. Auditing, you're not auditing the state, Keta. So the principal cannot go up there by herself and learn about the state. The principal really depends on the agent for gathering information. So the only thing that the principal can learn with auditing is what is the true result of the experiment. But the principal cannot learn beyond the experiment. So this is really truly delegated experimentation. You know, principal cannot have full information if the experiment is not full information itself to start with. So the principal is solely dependent on the information that's generated by the experiment chosen by the designer, okay? By the designer of the information. So we're gonna look at a PBE. That's a PBE for any sub games once, you know, once the principal chooses the task location and the auditing, and we go down to the three, the game three um, is a PBE for every sub game. All right, so just a recap on the timing. We start the game where the principal selects the allocation, either a separation or integrated, and what's the auditing intensity lambda. Then a designer is going to choose the experiment, knowing what's the lambda and what's the task allocation. Then the analyst, which is the same person if it is integrated or is a different person if it is separated, is going to privately observe the result of the experiment and is going to observe the tampering costs and is going to decide what's the message to send. Can be a truthful message so there is no tampering or the analyst can pay the tampering cost and send a lie, okay? Send a wrong message. Principal is gonna observe the report and with probability one minus lambda, the, the audit's gonna be inconclusive. So you learn nothing. You learned that the audit is inconclusive. You observe the, the message from the analyst and that's it. You have to update your beliefs according to that. Or with probability lambda, the principal is able to actually audit the experiment. He learns what's the data that's generating the experiment and learn what's the true outcome. Okay, what's the outcome that, that was really the outcome of the, at, at that experiment. Finally, uh, the principal chooses the action D, which is scale up or status quo here. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at, the, at this part of the sub game where the analyst is choosing a message, okay? So let's just, just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that the designer selects a experiment with three possible realizations, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So those are the possible results of the experiment. So Q3 would indicate scale up, Q1 and Q2 would indicate the status, status quo. What is the message that the analyst is gonna send? So if the analyst observes the result Q1, with some probability, this analyst is going to lie and is going to tell that the result is Q3. And with some probability, he's going to tell the truth. So basically, if the tempering cost is low enough, he's going to lie with probability row one. He's going to lie that the result is Q3. And with probability one minus row one, he's going to tell the truth that the result is Q1. Similar to Q2, if the result is Q2, he's going to lie with some probability row two. He's going to tell the truth with some probability one minus row two. Row two. And whenever he sees result Q3, he's going to tell the truth. Okay, so there's going to be an equilibrium of this sub game. Of course, the, the principle needs to discount. When the principal observes a message Q3, the principal needs to discount and update his belief to some Q3 hat, which depends on those line probabilities, just using Bayesian update. Okay. If the principal is able to successfully audit the experiment, now the principal is able to unpack Q3 to, hey, the guy is telling the truth or no, he's lying. 
and you learn the truth and then you get to your beliefs and then you take the actions. So it is important here for FQ1, that is a benefit from lying. I only, the sender only gains from lying with probability one minus lambda, which is the probability that the audit is unsuccessful. How much do you gain? You gain the difference between what the sender is doing here and what the sender does when the truth, which is Q1, okay? Notice that at this point, the sender is just indifferent. The sender is just indifferent between scaling up at the status quo. So it is important to take into account what is the probability that given that the, the sender is indifferent, what is the probability that the sender actually scales up given his indifference? Okay. Now, this C bar is exactly the cost where the sender is just indifferent between lying or not. So if the cost is higher than C bar, it's too costly, you don't lie, you tell the truth. If the cost is lower, you lie. Okay, it's worthwhile to lie. And this C bar, this cutoff C bar gives us the probability of lying because you lie with the probability, which is just what's the probability that C is below C bar. Okay, so we have this sub game and we have to compute all those probabilities, the probability of this guy uh, lying, the probability of this guy lying, the probability of the receiver taking the higher action. And you have to choose those probabilities such that, you know, the equilibrium closes, that we have a PBE, PBE here. Good news, we really will not be worrying about more complicated signals because we can just look at what we call status quo experiments, okay? So a status quo experiment is gonna be a binary experiment that either is gonna drive us from zero to zero, let's say it is the bad state, or is gonna drive us to some Q over here. And given this status quo experiment, the sender is going to mix with a probability that's consistent with my belief be discounted here. So I don't have to worry. I really don't. On, the, on this case, I don't have to worry about multiple uh, signal realizations. I really need to only worry about, by, about the classes of binary signal ex, uh, uh, experimentations that are at zero and at some point here on the red dot. Okay, so that's the you know, uh, first result of today that fix a sub game with lambda and some task allocation. There is always an equilibrium where the designer uh, chooses a, a status quo experiment, a robust status quo experiment. And if in some equilibrium, the designer gets V, he also gets V uh, choosing the optimal status quo experiment. Okay, so really, Within, within this, uh, uh, this case number one, we can just look at those uh, status quo experiments, binary experiments. Just a yes. clarification question. I'm assuming that the, the detail of the experiment itself depends on whether the task is integrated or not, right? So and that's, that's what we're gonna do now. Yes, so it's like, I only need to worry about those simple experiments right, right now. Uh, but of course, the Lambda matters, and the allocation of task matter. And that's, that's gonna be the main, the main result, uh, uh, result now, which is task separation, separating those guys and relaxing the audit, not auditing with probability one, those things are gonna to lead to Blackwell more informative experiments, okay? So proposition, uh, let, this be the optimal binary, the optimal status quo experiment given in lambda and k, in k. Okay, so given lambda that was established at the beginning of the game, and given k, whatever k was established at the uh, beginning of the game, what do we have? We have that separation gives you this higher belief that's weakly higher than the highest belief with uh, integration 
which means that's Blackwell more informative, okay? Because this guy is moving to the right. This guy, sorry. This guy is staying the same, is at zero. This guy is moving up. So we have a Blackwell more informative experiment. So separating those tasks leads to a Blackwell more informative exper uh, uh, experiment. And it's very intuitive. If I, the agent, and MT1 designing and running the experiment, I'm worried about line cost. Okay. If the result is bad, I'm going to be tempted to lie. So I'm worried about that. So what do I do? I get a less informative experiment in the first place, which reduces the probability that I'm going to lie. Okay. That's it. So I'm saying it's like, it's like me with ice cream. I have no self-control with ice cream at home. I just going to eat the whole ice cream. So I don't buy the ice cream in the first place because I know if it is there, I'm going to get it. So the same, same thing here. The, the designer, if he's the one doing the analysis, he's worried about the line cost because he's going to pay the line cost and he knows that he's going to lie with some probability if the result is bad. If his cost is low enough, he's going to lie and he's going to pay the cost. So he doesn't want to do that. So what, what he does, he chooses a slightly less, weekly less informative experiment in order to save on his line costs. So the design, the principle, the principle can get weekly more informative experiment by separating those tasks. Okay. Now the designer is not the one paying the, the line cost, it's someone else's problem. So designer is more willing to get a more informative signal. Result number two, fixed K. This Q here is known increasing in Lambda. So if I increase my audit intensity, I do not get a more informative signal, okay? I do not get that. So think, think about it. It's the shadow of doubt. If I do not audit you with a high probability, with probability one, whenever you tell me the result is good, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. I'm going to discount it. And because the principle is discounting it, now the, the designer is worried. It's like, he's discounting that. Let me get a more inform weekly more informative signal in order for the principle to not discount as much as we get that. Okay, so that's that's the incentive. That's the incentive here. Think about it. If lambda is one, if lambda is one, that's full commitment for the designer. He's not gonna lie. There's no reason to to lie because a lie is gonna always be caught. If a lie is always caught, you give the minimum amount of information. You know, you you put Q at Q high because you are a hundred percent trustworthy. If audit is 100%, you're 100% trustworthy. You never lie. There's no point in lying. You're going to get caught. Okay? So that's the idea that the, the, the principle here, by relaxing Lambda, by reducing audit, you know, I can get a weekly increase in uh, uh, experiment here exactly because of this shadow of the doubt, the grain of, of salt. So notice the trade-off that I have here. When I'm moving Lambda to force your experimentation, I'm giving up tampering because if I'm auditing less, now the analyst has incentives to lie because it's not being audited. So it is hard. I cannot get by moving Lambda, by increasing Lambda, the analyst tampers less, but also the signal is less informative. That's, that's the trade-off here, you know? If you are 100% trustworthy, no lies, no tampering, minimum amount of information, okay? And that's, you know, that's the, the, the uh, uh, important trade-off that we're trying to emphasize here. So the principle can eliminate tampering by perfectly auditing, but if you're perfectly auditing, you're gonna get the minimum amount of information, very little information from the designer. Uh, so this imperfect audit is that allows this, the, the decision maker to say, 
I do not know if you're telling the truth. Therefore, it is credible that I will take your good signal as a grain of salt. And I'm not going to just rub stamp what you're saying. Then I'm going to discount. And maybe with some probability, I'm not going to prove it. So those are the, the important trade-off and incentives going on, uh, going on here. Questions before I move on? All right. Now, let me two quick two quick definitions. Uh, we're gonna say that the designer is responsive to lambda auditing if he gives a more informative experiment when audit is lambda than when audit is one. Okay, so we are moving from lambda one to some lambda. We say that it is responsive to lambda if by moving by being by auditing less to lambda, the designer is going to give a more informative signal. Okay, and we say that the designer is responsive if such lambda exists. Okay, if there is a lambda, if there is some lambda less than one that gets the designer to choose a more informative signal than what he chooses when lambda is one, we call it responsive. So. Proposition, the principal weakly prefers to separate tasks, okay? And that's the intuition from before. Separating tasks gets you to give me that more informative, uh, weekly more informative signal. So that principal weakly prefers to separate tasks. And the principal prefers a imperfect lambda. So the optimal lambda is going to be less than one in every equilibrium if and only if the designer is responsive to audit, okay? So if the designer actually changes his to a more informative signal for some lambda that's not, that's less than one, then the optimal lambda is gonna be less than one. In particular, a sufficient condition for this is that F of zero being greater than zero. So if F of zero, if the PDF, uh, uh, PDF at zero is greater than zero, so we are assuming things are absolutely continuous here, that's enough mass, basically says that is enough probability, that is this probability that uh, the cost is gonna be really small and the guy is gonna lie. And this creates the grain of salt that induces the designer to be responsive because the receiver is gonna discount. Okay, so whenever there is some probability that the cost is going to be really close to zero, lambda, optimal lambda is not one. Okay, so let me stop here for a second because like that's one of the main messages that we want you guys to take home. That separation is good and a lambda less than one is good. Okay, we want to separate those tasks and we not, don't want to audit perfectly. We want to audit less than perfectly in those in those scenarios okay again questions all right so those were the two main levers that i wanted to talk about okay main lever one was separation we want to separate and main lever two is auditing we don't want to audit perfectly we want less than perfect audit just, now just here, clarification question about the the intuition yes. of the part. So if you perfect audit list and you uh, you, you sort of uh, get no rents because the uh, the 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 exactly the, the the most uninformative experiment. Yes. And you if you audit then uh, with some probability you actually audit and and then uh, you you get some benefit because the uh, the agent. Uh, chooses uh, not not perfect uninformative experiment. Is exactly. So right? so my rent. My rents coming from this exact. My rents coming from this. When I audit, when I audit, and it turns out that the the result is really Q, I'm gaining this because I'm approving, and I know that is better. That's the rent that I'm giving. Whenever I approve and I wasn't able to audit, now I'm just indifferent. I don't gain anything, and, and that's the thing with the lambda. By increasing lambda. I audit more, so I get this rent more often. But then the rent is smaller because if lambda is higher, Q is smaller. 
So that's like, that, that's, that's the race. It's like, I want to audit a lot because when I audit and I know that it's good, that's when I get the rent. But if I audit a lot, my rent is going to be really small because that Q is moving, is moving to, to, uh, to Q, Q bar. That's the, that's the thing here. Thanks. That's super helpful. All right. Now let me go to lever number. Th so we have 30 minutes. I think, I think I can uh, um, give you some idea of the other two levers. So the other lever here is what if the firm can somehow change the cost distribution? Okay, I can make it easier or I can make it harder for you to tamper with the information. So you can think about different ways uh, about this is like, what's the level of security that I put on my data system? You know, am I using blockchain to keep everything here so you cannot tamper with the information whatsoever? You know, do I have security guards and how, uh, on, on, on the data center? Now, how many cards do you need to swipe to get to the data, so on and so forth? So think about what happens if I can change that cost distribution, okay? So it turns out there are many optimal cost distributions. So let me look at a particular cost distribution that's optimal. And at the same time, it reduces the line cost, that, you know, because line cost is just a, a social waste. So we want to, to, to minimize that line cost that, that happened uh, when you actually lie. So a cost distribution that's optimal and actually minimize this line cost is the following. is a binary cost distribution. Cost of line is going to be zero with some probability, which is this. So we have a closed form. And the cost of line is going to be this guy with the complement probability. And this cost is high enough that you don't lie. So basically, a optimal distribution of costs is either is zero cost for you to lie, or is prohibitively costly for you to lie. And those things happen with some probability. Okay. My auditing, my optimal auditing together, you know, I'm pulling all the levers now. My optimal auditing intense is this, which is not one again, it's not one. I actually don't care what's the allocation here. With this distribution, I do not care what's the, what's the allocation. And with this, we get full experimentation. So with this cost distribution, we get full experimentation. Whenever, whenever the, the audit is successful, you approve if the state is one, you reject if the state is zero, Whenever the, the analyst tells me it is good, but I cannot audit, I just rubber stamp. It is approved. So in equilibrium, you know, things that are not audited just get rubber stamp, just get approved with probability one. Uh, and we can get the, the, design, the designer to choose full experimentation. Okay, so notice as I have more levers to pull, as I can play around with the, as I can play around with the cost distribution and with the auditing, I can actually achieve full experimentation. Okay. Notice, I still, I'm still losing a little bit on the on the auditing because I'm not auditing with probability one. So the principal still do some mistakes, but that, but that's the thing. You know, that's the best that the principal can do with those levers. I cannot, you know. I, I still get the the guy line with with some probability with those levers. Uh, how do I implement this? Is that a way to get a zero cost or a very high cost? You know, my my joke my joke is, I can have like a data center with an electronic door with some probability it faults. It doesn't work. So the guy you know the guy goes there try to lies, but the lock is fine, so he cannot access the data to tamper or with some probability it breaks down and then he can go and change and change the thing. Uh, and then I'm lying. So that's my joke on, on this. A more interesting one is we can implement this if I have a system of internal audit and external audit, okay? So I actually used to work with uh, investor relations in my, uh, many years ago when I was in Brazil. 
so I deal with uh, external auditing com uh, companies coming to the bank and looking at the, our um, our results and what are the information. And one of if you look at the financial results of companies, for example, and we look at Pricewaterhouse uh, uh, auditing the results, there are actually two types of audit. The company writes down a financial report, gives to the auditing company. The audit company says, this looks good, is approved, or this is wrong, you have to fix it. And when they say this is wrong, it has to fix it, they actually have to inform investors that they change the, the report because they were given a report that was wrong. So they have an obligation of telling that something was corrected in their report. But backstage, before the report is created, the auditing company can run an internal audit to check if the systems are good. And if something is wrong on the system, generate information, they can fix that, can ask that to be fixed. And this doesn't get reported or used to not get reported to the investors. So this internal audit, whether the internal audit found something wrong or not, didn't get reported. And there's actually an interesting literature now on accounting because many countries are changing the law and are forcing the auditors to report changes that are made in those internal reports. And what our result here says that in our model, actually you don't want to report that, okay? In our model, a optimal audit is the following. There is no cost of line, but there is an internal audit that's going to fix the result with some probability. So that for, you know, before, the, before the report is generated, the internal audit might fix that report with some probability. The principal doesn't get to know if that was uh, uh, fixed or not. And then once the report is generated, we have external audit, which is going to check that report. So this division between internal report uh, audit and external audit, where the result of the internal audit is not known to the principal, that can generate the same thing as our binary cost, okay? Uh, so this decoupling. And I think, you know, this is interesting because there is this debate in the accounting literature, whether or not the internal report should be gen should be public information or not. Those internal audit should be public information or not. Uh, and at least in our model, if the internal and external audits are well designed like this, you actually don't want to to get the result of the internal audit because that's as if we have that optimal distribution of um, of cost. All right, I have five minutes left, so. On the paper, if you have patience to look at it, we have a case number two, which is three actions, okay? Which are three actions that the principal can scale down, keep the status quo or scale up. So instead of having a binary action, now we have those three actions for the principal, okay? So if the principal knows that the state is really bad, he wants to scale down. He wants to kill the project. If the belief is intermediary, he wants to keep the status quo. And if the belief is really high, he wants to scale up. While the agent, high is better than the status quo, which is better than down, okay? So think about a project. We can take the project and expand it. We can keep it as it is, or you can just kill the project. And what the agent wants, the agent wants more is better. Okay, so increasing the project is better. Keeping it as it is, is the second best. Uh, decreasing, you know, killing the project is the worst, worst case scenario. So what is interesting here? Okay, the interesting here is that now the designer can choose very different signals. One signal can be status quo or scale up, while the other signal can be scaled down, scale up, okay? So that's the difference between this and the previous case that now 
the designer can choose an even more informative signal. The one on the right is more informative. It's black, well, more informative. So he can choose a more informative signal with the caveat that when news or bad news, the project gets, gets destroyed. It's a very low payoff. Also notice incentives to lie here are much bigger. The stakes are higher. If you get a bad signal, you are really tempted to lie because that's such a huge difference. While here, temptation to lie is not so big, okay? So now there is a worry about adverse switch, that if I separate tasks or if I decrease auditing, the designer might change from this to this, which is bad. So we have to take that into account. So we basically say we give conditions such that separate tasks are still better and lambda is less than one are still better. At the end of the day, do you know what the principal would like to do? Take one arm out of the question. The principal would like to take the status quo out of question. If the principal can commit to not give the status quo, then he gets more information from the, from the designer. So that's my last lever. You kill the status quo, you say status quo is out of the table. Okay, we cannot take status quo, it's up or down decision. Together with separation and together with imperfect audit. That's where the sender wants to do. He wants to get rid of that status quo because that status quo is making it harder for the principal. Sorry, the principal wants to get rid of this because it's making it harder for the principal to, to get information. So wrapping up, last slide. So we're trying to develop this theory of credible skepticism uh, to explain organization in data analysis. So it's kind of, hey, I could use blockchain to keep all my information inside an organization safe and there is no tampering at all because everything is there. Do you really want to do that? And say, yes, in one hand, there's no line, but in another hand, because there is no line, there's also very little incentive for experimentation. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, no, this idea of the principal wants to many times separate those tasks, tasks and have a imperfect, imperfect auditing. And also like personally, I thought, I thought it was very interesting, this idea of uh, internal and external audit that I really, it is good here to have this internal audit where I do not know the result of the internal audit. I only know the result of the external audit and eight o'clock. So that's it. Thank you very much all for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so this is uh, perfect timing. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, stop recording and then we can have uh, informal discussion.